Hello and welcome to Innovative in Education's Organic Chemistry Series. My name is Mike Evans, and I'll be your guide through the exciting world of organic chemistry. We here at Innovative in Ed are here to help you learn. We're here to help you learn with free, widely available educational materials created by experts for you. So whether you're watching this material live or watching it recorded, the goal is to help you learn. So use this material to the best of your advantage. And if you have questions and you're watching this live, feel free to stop us. We'll have question periods as we go to help you with any concerns or issues you may be having with the material. My specialty is in organic chemistry, and so what I'd like to talk to you today uh, about today is sort of a general overview of what organic chemistry is and why we care about it. What you're looking at here is a chart that shows you the elements of organic chemistry. You can see from this chart that there are some very interesting trends in some, uh, some of the composition of various things we find in nature. So the bar here shows you the composition of crude petroleum. And the interesting thing about crude petroleum is that, of course, we use it for fossil fuels. And you can see from the tan bar that carbon is a huge constituent of crude petroleum. Down here at the bottom, you see hydrogen makes up the number two component. Likewise, the three bars over here show you some various constitutions of crude plant matter. Uh, so looking at plant matter and also at animal, animal matter, this bar on the far left, uh, far right if you're watching this video uh, recorded, we can see that carbon makes up a huge percentage of these. And it's the four key elements of organic chemistry that are also key to life. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And these four elements we'll see again and again. And these are really the cornerstone of organic chemistry. And this bar graph, the elemental composition of many of the things important to life and the byproducts of life, show us just how important organic chemistry is to biology and the study of how life works. Biology at its root is chemistry, and the vast majority of it is actually organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is a period two science. What does this mean? Well, it means that we deal with elements that are on the second period predominantly. The second period means the second row of the periodic table, and that encompasses five major elements that we'll see used again and again. The first is boron. Boron is to the left of carbon. It can be found right here. And it has a valence of three, if you're familiar with the valence concept. Moving to the right, we have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, the big three. And then following that, we have fluorine. Now, below the second period, there are a variety of elements that come into play, but we often make analogies to these big five, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, when talking about the elements below. So as you may remember, if you've taken general chemistry, elements in the same group or column of the periodic table often have similar behavior, and that's, uh, that's absolutely the case here. So all of the elements, for instance, in this column of the periodic table, which we call the halogens, group 17, right there, are all going to have similar behavior. And so understanding the behavior of period two will allow us to make extensions to elements lower on the periodic table. And of course, you see the one kind of out-of-place element is hydrogen. And hydrogen uh, is interesting for its single valence, and it's found, of course, in a variety of contexts in organic chemistry, sort of uh, filling in where bonds need to be made. Now, organic chemistry is primarily a graphical language. What does that mean? Well, that means that chemists communicate to one another through graphical structures. How they do it is that we rely on a structure drawing convention called Lewis structures, which has been around since time immemorial. And this is a convention that you should get very familiar with and used to seeing. So Lewis structures are absolutely critical uh, for the study of organic chemistry. Using Lewis structures and getting familiar with them, you'll see that a variety of structures pop up again and again. B 
Because of this, organic chemists are able to communicate with each other with relative ease. So we see structures again and again, and the functionality built into those structures translates from one context to another. So it's very easy for chemists to think about one functional group as part of one molecule in a different context and still think about the same behavior. So what exactly does this idea of Lewis structures entail? Well, Lewis structures are basically built from three pieces. The first is the atomic symbols. So we represent nuclei as simply their letters in a Lewis structure. Those letters represent the position of nuclei within a Lewis structure. To represent bonds, which you'll recall from general chemistry, are composed of two electrons each, we represent those as lines between nuclei. So there's a couple examples of bonds for you. Some electrons are not involved in bonds, but are localized on atoms. We call those lone pairs, and we represent those as a pair of dots on the atom. So these are the big three structures that we use as part of Lewis structures. All Lewis structures are built from combinations of these three elements. The atomic symbols, lines to represent bonds, and lone pairs. One interesting thing about the Lewis structure concept is that it allows us to think about a limited number of ways that we can put an octet of electrons around an atom. So what you're looking at behind me is a table of octet configurations. And there are really a very limited number of ways to draw the, uh, the Lewis structure of a molecule placing an octet around every atom. And so here you see 11 different ways we can do this. The table is organized according to the number of what are called electron pair domains. I'll go ahead and write that down because that's a really important ter uh, term for you to keep in mind. Electron pair domains, or EPDs. And that can be found up here on the columns. And then the number of non-bonding electron pairs is here on the rows. Organizing it this way, we can easily see the different ways that we can form an octet around an atom. So if we take a look at this then, with four EPDs and no electron pairs, we represent that with four single bonds. So no bone pairs and four domains. Each domain contains a pair of electrons, as we would expect from the name. As a result, there are four electron pair domains um, around this A atom with four single bonds. Moving to three electron pair domains but no lone pairs, we simply have three single bonds. And now to achieve an octet of electrons around the atom, we add a double bond. Now we have three electron pair domains, the double bond counting as one domain, one region of space containing electron pairs but we have no lone pairs on that atom. With two electron pair domains and no lone pairs, we would then have either two double bonds or a triple bond and a single bond. So you can begin to see here how this represents two electron pair domains. And again, we see no lone pairs, which is why it's up here in the first row of the periodic table, uh, of, the, uh, of the table of octet configurations, I should say.